Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to AB Witch Journal. Uh, today, as you can notice, I have um, a person that I definitely, definitely admire. I had the opportunity to read and review um, their book, uh, Chris um, Allen, correct? It's um, Allen. So Chris it's Allen. Allen. Chris yeah. Allen. That's the right way to pronounce the last name. So there you go. <laughs> um, it's boring. I know. I'm boring. <laughs> no, it's all good. <laughs> Chris Allen definitely is a practitioner that's been creating a lot of books for quite a while. However, the the only one that I have had the opportunity to read so far is the Black Book of Jonathan Not Brazel. Typically like to ask uh, to the authors, um, please let us get to know a little bit about yourself. Let us get to know a little bit about your practice um, before we dive in the book. So um, I have I've been practicing uh, witchcraft and paganism since 1992. Wow. So what, 31, so I was like 16, 17 years old at the time. And um, I became ordained with a queer pagan group called the uh, Fellowship of Phoenix in 2002. And I, at the same year, I was initiated into a traditional witchcraft. And, but I'm also a massage therapist and and a Reiki Incredible. healer, energy healer, all that stuff. So I got the dark and light. Um, recently, I just got my I got my um, master's for the degree uh, in divinity. So I'm currently uh, working as a chaplain at in spiritual care as a hospital. Um, I work a lot with like death and dying. Um, trauma, things like that. So, um, you know, in my whole spiritual practice, I've worked with the with the ancestors, the land, the gods, fey, elf, spirits, all that. Um, and yeah, and now I'm writing and and doing all those things, and you know, keeping myself occupied, stuff like that. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's incredible the very fact that you've been working, um, and practicing for such a long time um yeah. on my end i just have five years within my practice and okay. i do feel that it's been a really nice adventure before becoming a witch i was studying theology so it's not too different you know i was about to say <laughs> it's not different at all um coming out of uh, Christianity, I, I do feel that theology gave me nice tools, especially when it comes to talk about research, you know, and understanding the nuances that so many cultural elements have. I do want to ask you a little bit more about your origins within the practice. Uh, you do mention that you be, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you were initiated and um, repeat the Phoenix, uh, the Phoenix, sorry. Uh, the, it's the uh, Fellowship of the Phoenix. It's a queer pagan Phoenix. group. Here. Yeah, yeah. And um, when did you start? It, um, when did you join um, the so? Open? I'm actually one of the founders. It was strange because I so I worked with an ordained priest of a different group. Yes. Um. And and so I be be he came or ordained initiated ordained. all the above in 2002. And then he and I and a few other people decided, hey, all the groups are very straight and like, oh, the god and the goddess, and male, yes. female. So we're like, okay, so why don't we have a queer group that's for us and things like that. Yes. So I um, I helped uh, create the uh, Fellowship of the Phoenix and I was on the, the board of directors in, let's see, 04 to 07. Incredible. Um, and and now I lead ceremonies and rituals and all that. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I'm like, I, um, uh, we're here in Chicago and Seattle, so we actually have two temples. Um, partly what happened is is that about half of our group all moved to Seattle, so now we're in two places. So yes. that's how that. 
much. Yeah, yeah I definitely get uh, very interested in that, into that, that aspect because so far of the authors that I've had the opportunity to speak with, you are the first one that is actually ordained and you know that uh, do belong to a, um, let's say like an official, uh, is, is, the, is the right word to say an official coven itself? So it isn't a coven, it's so it's a so you know a coven is like uh, between three and 13 okay which is okay. a circle in, in a paganism we'd like to say either church group temple order whatever um it's usually larger okay um all together i think we have like 60 70 people in chicago i think we have about 30 35 um oh, wow. People come and go. It used to be uh, larger, but as I said, half of them moved to Seattle. Um, and, you know, and what makes me um, a official, I guess, is that we're 501c3 as a non for profit church. And basically, it doesn't take any special skills. It just, you have to. Um, apply to the government and you have to have certain criteria yes. which we had a whole bunch of people take um help us take care of some uh, lawyers and accountants were you know it's always good to have uh a uh, queer witchy accountants and things <laughs> like that because they can help you with things like that so yeah so that's all that that is incredible. I'm very, very glad to hear about that. And and obviously I'm curious because it's something that um, in my experience, you know, coming out of uh, Christianity, even though I do still, uh, let's say, work uh, with Jesus, let's say like that, um, yeah. I am not religious, at not anymore. And by being in a big community my entire life, leaving that and start working on like a soul practitioner type of path, it sometimes I do miss the, the yeah. I want to use the word fellowship now that you mention it, like being surrounded be, yeah. with other people with the same goal and interest. So yeah, that is really cool. I mean, it's kind of cool yeah, because I was solitary from 1992 to about 2000, so for a long time, you know, only because this was pre-internet. This was pre-Facebook. Yes book and instagram and all that if you wanted to learn to do um, um, um magic and spells and things like that you had to just read the books you didn't have you know groups and and online classes and so um when i when i had the opportunity to help start the fellowship it was cool to have people who are like brand new people experienced people young people older yes. people and it's fun and, and some people i'm like oh i don't share your same philosophy however the cool thing is is that these are people who you know have similar backgrounds they started in christianity and they changed the witchcraft and paganism and and how they want to share and learn and love and grow and expand yes. and heal and yes and scream and drum and dance and all those things you know <laughs> yes yeah and i do think and i i feel that this is a perfect way um the perfect um, element to pick to segue into uh the black book of jonathan not bristle i do feel that witchcraft in that sense has helped me to recover no regain a lot of my power a lot of that sense of ownership i guess of my mm. own life and independence too and i say this because while I was reading the book, at least the first uh, three or four uh, chapters, I, I will say more like the first three, I fell in love with the character of the devil as is presented in this book. <laughs> it is impossible yeah. not to see this figure that rejected by so many savior uh -huh. for others um uh -huh. uh, pretty much empower uh jonathan in a very unique way and part of the survival of jonathan came from that sense of blasphemy if that makes sense jonathan mm -hmm. lost everything by the hand mm -hmm. of god if we can say it and gain everything back by the hand of the devil if we can take that analogy please dare to elaborate a little bit of 
this experience of Jonathan with the devil and your particular experience uh -huh. as well with this character? You know, one of the things that they uh, used to say a long time ago is there's no devil in the crash. And they said that and it, it, it makes sense because You know, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and even 90s, of uh, Wiccans and and of witches were trying to become, I guess, accepted. Yes. Yeah. You know, because in in the 80s you had this uh, satanic uh, panic. Panic. So yeah, like this. Uh, every time hysteria. something happened, they blamed it on Satan and the witches, yeah. and yeah. so a lot of people are like, oh no, there's no devil in the craft, but there is a horned god. And there is a horned god of the forest. And one of the things, and I'm from the country in Texas, and so one of the things that, especially in the South, the Satan is not the same as the devil. It is not the same. Because Satan, you know, if we think of the person who is a king of lies, who tries to kill and destroy and and you know, and torture and, and just do evil things. And the devil, you know, I really enjoy mythology and story. And, you know, think about it. the reason Lucifer was cast out of heaven was because he loved God so deeply, he refused to bow down before God's new love interest. Adam. So it's kind of has this homoerotic type of thing. And if you think about Absolutely. it, Absolutely. God doesn't have a gender. Lucifer doesn't have a gender. However, if we, you know, if we superimpose his idea of father, he, him, Lucifer refused to bow down uh, to Adam. And so, you know, that started a schism and he was cast out of heaven. However, one of the things you have to remember about the story of Adam and Eve. First of all, I'm a biblical uh, student for, for working on being a scholar. I have my degree in theology. In the Hebrew Bible, the serpent was not Satan, period. It was a magical serpent that could talk. So, however, however, if we superimpose Lucifer onto the serpent, what the serpent did was convince Eve to eat of the tree of knowledge. So Lucifer was the instigator to rebel against the patriarchy, who's God, and instead of being a subservient slave, taught humans to be free by teaching them wisdom. So that's why a lot of people are like, oh, actually this whole Lucifer character isn't so bad. Now, <laughs> Absolutely. you know, the devil, the devil, is think of it more as a powerful spirit and the, the devil himself is not so much the king of evil he's more of i'm an ancient ancient forest spirit or primordial god who i have some power and i can give you the powers of the witch and you can do whatever you want with it because if you notice in stories the devil only shows up in your life once or twice <laughs> however he is a trickster sometime a mischief maker and mischief is not the same as evil and in the mythology mischief makers or tricksters usually are there in in stories they trip us up so that we can learn something so that we we can grow spiritually so we can you, you know like for example it's usually the the guy who who thinks he's hot shit who <laughs> the trickster trips him up he falls and then he realizes i need to be a better person right so if we take those ideas and superimpose on super propose them on the the of witches devil or the witch father well that's who's coming to us you know um for me and my own personal theology i think he's a combination between the witch father of lucifer of uh, the ancient uh forest god and all that so, so that's how that's how i see you know 
And the thing is about in the story, I wanted to show how the devil, exactly what you said, when God took everything away, it was the devil who saved him. I, I certainly agree with you on all of that. And I, uh, I mean, uh, as we were mentioning, the theology aspect, um, those who have had the opportunity to study it a little bit, we understand that the devil is just a combination of characters, uh, different characters from different stories through time, through culture. And that does not take away from him, if we can call him him, um, the power and the essence of his being. Like, um, I did have, and I mention it often, because obviously I do feel that that's my fundamental thing now. I did take a class with Jason Miller called The Black School of St. Cyprian. And one of the structure breaking, let's say like that, because again, I come from a Christian household and that's why I felt yeah. so connected with Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan was had a moment of what's going on with my life, what is going to be about me. I just lost everything. And I was told that I just had to pray and be nice and God will take care of me. And now out of nowhere, I'm not my family has not only died, um, they are saying that we are cursed. You know, so it was a very, very interesting element. But as I was mentioning, um, in one of the classes, I cannot elaborate much, but Jason does mention that uh, Devil pretty much is like a, the only character through history, of course, in our westernized uh -huh. society, that instead of growing old, grows new. Because it's a combination, mm -hmm. an amalgamation of character, and uh, all the time his persona is evolving and changing along with society, which is a very interesting perspective. Uh, right. You were talking about uh, Satan, and certainly Satan in the um, Old Testament, we are talking about the accuser, uh, completely different from the snake. There's no Satan. There is no Satan. It was just the accuser. There is an accuser, exactly yeah. what you said. I'm glad you said that because he was the accuser. An accuser doesn't mean I'm going to kill. I'm going to maim. Oh, it evil. means, hey, oh. you sin. <laughs> You're bad. Hey, God, he's bad. I'm pointing the finger. He's the accuser. Yeah, so yeah. I'm glad you said that. No, totally. It, it, it's funny, but again, we go through time and Christianity kept growing and kept taking over different cultures and anything that was not the Christian God was the devil. And that's oversim uh, oversimplification just took over so many cultures and so many stories. And that's why we see so many spirits that definitely are not maybe the Christian devil. It's just another spirit from another culture, from another space. Right. We are just calling right. it devil. And that's why I was reading uh, your book and I was so happy to see that that oversimplification was also so easily explained because we are seeing the witch father, but we also are seeing like um, the image of the king of the fairies, which we are going to talk more about that. Um, two different characters but to an extent even jonathan was like is this the same person maybe it is maybe it's not i don't know i don't care i don't need to worry <laughs> i don't need yeah. to worry about that so yeah i i did love uh the story and as i said i did love um uh, i feel very represented by jonathan um something that i definitely want to ask you we can see how jonathan start his taking his first path um steps sorry his first steps within witchcraft mm -hmm. And yeah. everything begins with the initiation. And mm -hmm. initiation is a topic that is very unique because now nowadays that so many people has so much access to which information, which it was not as common yeah. in the past. Yeah. Initiation is not such a big thing uh, always. Um, uh -huh. There to elaborate on that. So I am kind of old school. Well, I'm 48 years old. I was initiated when I was 27 for the first time. Um, I have several in initiations. And so the thing about an initiation in some witch groups, they, they do connect you to their magical power source. So in some witch groups, it depends upon the group you do become more powerful, period. Not all, it depends on the tradition. However, that's an extra thing. It's the important thing, it's about you having access to, uh, uh, to the egregor. So the egregor or the spirit of the circle, 
So that is the uh, spirit of a circle is very protected by the leaders, and you can only ha have access to that spirit through initiation. However, the most important part about initiation is to be connected to the ancestral lineage. That is the most important thing is about community. So we in, in the fellowship, we have a um, an initiation and it, and it basically connects us to, to everyone else. I mean, Kel, does that mean I'm like, I'm going to drain all your power for my magic? No, it doesn't mean that. But, uh, uh, but when you're a part of a community, there is a special feeling of a family connection, ancestry, safety, even health, yes, healing. Um, but at the same time, there's also a uh, connection of I want to say problems, but stuff. So, like for example, all families have their strengths and all families have their weaknesses. So, well, when you initiate someone who has a whole lot of problems, they bring that problem into the circle or into the group, and so you have to be very careful about um, who, who you initiate. Like yeah, and a lot of public. Uh, uh, groups have a rite of passage. So a rite of passage is like a baptism yeah. versus a connection to the actual group. You know, I think initiations are important. I also think that don't become initiated until you're really ready. So don't do it for the, the magical power. Do, uh, do it because you are ready to be a part of a community. One of the things that I struggle with as a priest is um, a lot of people want all the uh, benefits and and no, none no, no, of the responsibilities. Ex <laughs> exactly responsibilities. We all have our strengths. We all have our dramas. We all have the things we need to heal. And my hope is is that we take our strengths together and heal people who need to be healed. I mean, that's my hope. Um, and things like that. So I think an initiation is important, but only if you're ready to, to become a part of a community. However, I do think that the spirits and gods can initiate you without being a part of a group. And to do that, well, that happened to Jonathan. Jonathan didn't have a circle. The devil came to him and said, hey, I, I'm going to help you you i got you and he initiated him into you know the, the power of the witch so you an initiation can be a blessing of the gods too so there's that it's funny because um when i made the book review the first thing that came to mind is that whether we want it or not i do feel that um every uh, we have multiple initiations i feel uh, or at oh, least yeah multiple um Let's say it's level up. Let's say level up um, throughout our life. But I do feel that as practitioner, as witches, and uh, also as a queer person, there is a point in our life that we say, okay, definitely from now on, I'm not the same person as I was before. Uh, That's right. I am coming out publicly. Let's say it like that. Um, not saying that being a witch is coming out, but you you know what I mean. Uh, I mean, it can be coming extent, out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the judgment and, and hate and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, I do feel that we as witches, we do have a point in our life that certainly we are fully in. We are not halfway there. Uh, if we are serious about what we are talking about, we are fully in. Um, that fully in looks different for everyone across the board, of course, but we are witches and we say okay I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm into this when I read your book uh, uh, shortly afterwards I had the opportunity to read a book in a similar tonality uh, it's the um, cunning words it was written by Marshall oh yes. Marshall yes, yeah, yes. I, Marshall love him. Obsessed. I love him I love him he's Obs fabulous oh, yeah I love Marshall uh, incredible and his book he's was fabulous a yeah, in, in, his book was in a very similar tonality, um, stories to teach witchcraft, which mm -hmm. it was the first time that I read these type of uh, books. And ironically, I read yours first and then his. Um, and the first thing that I did was like, okay, 
obviously I'm a practitioner. I decided that was going to be a witch. I am already um, connecting with my ancestors, but I'm going to create my own self-initiation type of ritual. Let's say like that. Yeah. And yeah. I just draw from um, this, your book and his. And it was a very unique experience. I decided to bake my own bread. I decided to like get some wine, um, some other elements as well that very personal, but it, I did write it down on my book, which is actually over here. And I did sign the book, uh, which is mine. <laughs> I love and, it though. I yes. love it though. I, yeah, I think that's a big deal. I think that's it great. Was. It was, it was, yeah. and, and I do feel that it was a very, even if it's, it was a very cathartic moment for me because it was a, I'm regaining the power that was taken away from me uh, during so many years within Christianity. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it was a very unique moment. And again, I do feel very um, connected with um, Jonathan on that side. We do see that Jonathan not only goes through um, the initiation process, but uh, mm -hmm. we can also get to read more traditional witchcraft elements mm -hmm. as the familiar, yeah. the stank, flying in the spirit. Tell us about a little bit about your personal experience with these elements and how huh? you decided to place them into Jonathan's story. So my very first initiator was my friend and teacher, Matthew Calvin Wood. And he what he is an initiate and a leader in traditional witchcraft. I've always been big in shamanism and like shamanic journeying, spirit animals, things like that. I've worked with the Lakota um, in indigenous uh, spirituality. And the thing about how Matthew taught his, his view of traditional witchcraft it was very um shamanic and so it was like shape-shifting and 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 shamanic journeying to the sabbath and you know and and like really connecting to the earth you know in 2000 you didn't have a whole lot of um, books saying go outside and connect with the earth and and go into a trance and talk to the trees, talk to the earth, talk to the moon. It was more of a, you know, cast your circle, all the four elements uh, and cast your spell. But this was like, no, see the spirits, hear them, feel them, connect with them. And I was like, this is the witchcraft for me. I am into it, you know? And so, you know, in my own experience, um, with it, years and years and years of this, I really, in my spiritual practice, I work a lot with the gods and ancestors, but I also work with the energies of the earth, the trees, the moon, the stars. And, you know, in my own private circle that I have, I talk about, you know, the first thing I say is, everyone take a breath, connect to each other, and now connect to the earth. Breathe in the earth and, and to yourself. Connect to the stars. Breathe in the stars. Look around you. See the trees. See the rocks. Um, uh, uh, breathe in these energies. And that's how I start almost everything. Because it's about all these connections and all these sh sh shamanic connections and things like that. Um, and, you know, doing the Sabbath is just astral projection. Uh, that going into trance and drumming and and dancing and i always say screaming because i think that a part of witchcraft is really going deep within yourself yeah. and finding that primal, primal. Uh, that primal power and really bringing that out and channeling that like that animal magic that earth magic into your spells yes. you know and so that's how I approach it. And so um, I wrote, in, in all my previous books, I wrote about traditional witchcraft all the time, but it was subtle. It was very subtle. It was like, oh, this is how we connect to the stars, or this is how we do the ancestors. So I decided that everyone and their cat was writing a traditional witchcraft book. And I didn't want to 
repeat the same thing over and over again because I hate that because I hate, oh, here's another book about 101 witchcraft, Blah, boring. Yes. So I said, hey, you know what? And in and, and my uh, Lakota traditions that, that I follow, they teach, they teach you spirituality through storytelling. And so I thought, hey, what if I I told the story of Jonathan through his point of view, through his story, through, you know, imagine an old man, an old witch who's like 80 saying, let me tell you my stories. Let me teach through you through my own personal story. And that's how Jonathan came to be. And so that's how, you know, how my story and his story story uh, can converge because I remember when I was a brand new practitioner, I would read a book about uh, uh, get the blue candle, get four quarts, anoint the candle with oil, light this incense, say this, this, and this. And I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. What do I think? What do I say? What do I do? Jonathan tells you what to say and what to think and what to do. I do admit that from this side as a Latino, you know, as a South American, as a Venezuelan, the connecting with the spirit self and like this type of dream walking type of situation, traveling through the astral plane, flying mm -hmm. in the spirit, it has so many similarities. Even within the Pentecostal Christian church, it, there is like this uh, element that you can find in the Bible as being taken in the spirit to a vision as yeah. Paul, you know? Mm -hmm. and so many similarities, different ways to call it across culture. So I did love to see how you presented, which, by the way, was very interesting towards the end of the book, like these astral uh, projections, these witch battles, very fan fantastic. Uh -huh. it, it was a very unique way to portray the practice and something that I did enjoy as well, because my first difficulty as a practitioner was... Am I supposed to imagine everything? Uh, am I supposed right, to imagine right. that I'm talking to a spirit? Am I supposed to imagine yeah. that they are talking back? <laughs> and the answer is yes. You're yeah. supposed to imagine it. Yes. <laughs> that's that's the thing. I didn't know. I, I, I assumed that in my practice, I was actually meant to receive external influence, not necessarily mm -hmm. through my own mind uh, of communication, at the time to talk about meditation or yes, uh, visualizations. It's something that I'm still, I, I am still working on. And old Henry, which who, old Henry, the, I love I, old Henry. I, I love old Henry. I did love the way that he was teaching to uh, Jonathan. Imagine it. And then we have Mr. I am sorry. Now I do. I did forget his last name. Um, uh, Pickleworth, Mr. Pickleworth. Uh, Pickleworth. Picklesworth. Pickleworth. Yes, yes, yes. Picklesworth. Picklesworth, yeah. Which was very cool, the way that he was getting close. Uh, uh, it was a big surprise to me to get to see that he was actually a witch as well. Hey, see this in your mind's eye. Visualize. It, it was such a, a unique experience. And I do uh -huh. agree with you. The way that you thought in this book, it, I do feel that it's very beginner friendly. And mm -hmm. also... I do feel that it's very cool the way that you easily portray witchcraft and spirituality. I call it spirituality because at the end, that's what he did. It he is a spirituality. Yeah. Absolutely, it is. Absolutely. Something really cool that I did notice as well from the book, and I did want to ask you. And, and you know what? I'm going to bring this question first before I dive onto that. Okay. Is Jonathan real? Is Jonathan real? As real as, um, as he can be. <laughs> so here's here's the short of it. Here's the short of it. So um, I've worked a lot with the uh, witch ancestors. And so I call them into my circle all the time. And when I'm doing spells, I invite the witch ancestors. And some of them I, I know who passed. And some of them are from way back in the past. And I didn't know them when they were alive. And, and the thing is, you have to remember, I've been doing this for uh, 30 years now, so I can see spirits. I can see them. I talk to them. I can hear them. I journey with them. I fly with them. I feel them in my heart, all those things. And um, 
one of the things when I sat down to write the book, I had an idea. I, I wanted to tell a story of witchcraft through storytelling, but I didn't know how or who or what would happen. So I conjured the witch ancestors and I said, hey, tell me your story. And I have a, a ancestral vessel that I, uh, I used to conjure the ancestors. And Jonathan, uh, and yes, I changed his name. His name is really not Jonathan. I changed his name. I imagine so. <laughs> but the uh, spirit came through and he goes, here's my story. Here's what happened to me. And there's a few things I use what we call poetic license. So, for example, I spiced it up just a little bit in some some parts. But the general uh, story is his. Now, Grant, now, now I'm from Texas. Um, that's why it's set in Texas. The cool thing is I never say that. However, as the author, I'm telling you it happens in Texas. And people in Texas sometimes, you know what a, a fish story is? A, a, fish. a fish story? I'm afraid that a I fish don't. story. It's when someone catches a fish that's this big and says, I caught a fish this big. Yeah. <laughs> so he may have embellished a little as a respectful student because he was teaching me as um, I did not contradict him or, or say anything like that. So I let him tell his story as he remembered it. <laughs> so is Jonathan real? Yes. Is Jonathan part of the, the mythology? Yes. Is he a storyteller? Yes. Is he an ancestor? Yes. I, yeah. I'm glad to get to hear that. I, I do feel that even though even though um, there is so many, um, and, and please forgive me um, if I say it like this, of course, there are so many fantastical elements in the story at the end. If it's, yes. At the end of the day, it's a parable, as you mentioned, as, as the book says. But it definitely has like a very, very personal experience latched mm -hmm. onto it. It's hard to feel that I'm reading Harry Potter, for example. Uh, yeah, no, it's not Harry yeah. Potter at all. <laughs> That's one of the things I wanted to make sure that didn't happen. I didn't want it to seem like a fantasy. I didn't want it to seem like Lord of the Rings or, or even a mythology. I didn't want it to feel like that. I wanted it to feel very visceral. Yes. I wanted the reader to feel like I'm Jonathan this could happen to me or it has happened Absolutely. you know there are, there are several situations where jonathan screws up and he fails and he knows he fails but he learns from those failures just like how we fail i can't tell you how many spells i screwed up or how many times i did a spell and i was like oh that was not supposed to happen yeah um, same and, you know but that's part of the fun that's part of the learning that's part of the you the know being experience. a the human experience you know we learn from our challenges and we learn from our successes again it's a story i will easily give this book if i have a new practitioner with me i will easily recommend this book and be like listen these are this is a, a good foundation to uh yeah. pick from um and same as um i'm, I'm as cunning words I, I feel that the teaching through stories it gives a sense of life and, and experience very different than just guiding a person through a grimoire is it it's it, it's colorful and the parable and i i hate to going back again onto the christian element but there's a reason of why the parable was given to the to the people you know not everyone is able to digest the food in the same way well i think it's important oh yes i think that's important because a lot of us think in pictures i think in pictures and i also yes speak in audio of course but i think in pictures and so when someone tells me a story i remember you know like have you ever had those teachers who tell a funny story and, and you remember well, what they're talking about because they're good storytellers you know one of the th things i also enjoy i like i said before i really enjoy mythology in mythology, it teaches you magical practice if you know how to translate the myth into a practical 
works. And I was uh, going to say earlier, you talked about the Grim Wars and stuff. They actually did have a story. They had the Hebrew Bible. So they already had their story because it, I think before you can successfully do a, you know, the 72 goetic spirits of, in, of Solomon, you need to read that part of the Hebrew Bible. It makes more sense. And granted, can you conjure the spirits? Of course you can. Can you really connect with them? Perhaps. But it's a deeper connection if you know their story. Yeah. You know, it's it's kind of like humans. Like, I can become friends with someone, but when they tell me their story, like, where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to school? Who did you love? Who broke your heart? Who pisses you off? Who makes you happy? Who makes you laugh? Yes. I get to know a deeper sense of that person, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. I Again, I that's why I feel that the book was a, a very nice experience and it was so easy to connect with Jonathan because I had my own story uh, that in one way or another did connect with this character. Again, this book gave me uh, cool steps to also call on my own familiar, uh, which I've uh -huh. been consistently working with. Yep. Again, I read your book along with Cunning Wars. I do feel that this this gave me a foundation to start a practice. It was not as um, similar to the one that I had before because mm -hmm. as Latino, I was trying to focus more on, you know, prayer and holy saints, very uh, folk Catholic based as it's typically done in South America. So it was very cool. Something that I love as well is the way that Jonathan cast um, his spells. Very simple practically use the same candle for everything and yeah. whatever he has at hand. Please share. Yeah, share on so that. I remember, I remember like way back in the day, you know, when I first learned to cast the spells, it was like you have 17 candles and 17 crystals and four and four to seven herbs and then you have to draw a circle right now all well. the corners <laughs> da, da 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 and it went on for hour forever and ever and ever and then can my traditional witchcraft teacher would just like yeah we don't do any of that so we take a candle we dance around and, and we scream at the moon and can i tell you that spell happened immediately and i was just like so why is it that some people need all these steps and some people just need one candle and they dance around and he said if you're a, a beginner you need the steps you need to connect you need to understand you need to where how do you feel what do you smell uh, what do you see um how do you draw in the power when you're experienced, you don't need all that because it's just a tool. It's a tool. What you need is yourself. And speaking of me personally, I love candles. Candles make me feel so witchy and fun. And I like incense. So that's all I need. And so, you know, in traditional witchcraft, you have to remember people in the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, you didn't go to your occult store and buy witch surprise you open up your open up your your cupboard and whatever you had that's what you used because things were hard to find and they were also poor so if i can't afford all these crystals where am i gonna get crystals from you know yeah so you know i would use like spices or a candle i use to light my house at night time i might use that same candle you know and so when you give yourself permission to use what you have like, I remember reading way back in the day, in the 90s, how like, oh, the tool has to be made a special way and the candle has to be made a special way. Yes. No, that's not true. That's <laughs> not true at all. It's more important. The uh, candles is just a focal point and, and, and you are the magic. You are the magic. So Jonathan teaches that. He teaches that you are the magic, but let's throw a candle and this herb and this and yeah. ooh, this make magic happen. Uh, I mean, I'm going to be honest. My memory is not the best, but from what I remember from the book, I think the mullein maybe is the only herb that is mentioned. Yes, it's to summon a ghost. It's to summon a ghost. Yes. It's the items needed. One candle, whiskey, uh, mullein, yes. charcoal, 
and something to light it with. The yes. end. These spells are are purposely simple. Let's see. The Devil's Feast, a drinking vessel, wine or, or ale, bread, and a candle. Like, that's all you need. Well, oh, I have a question for you. What did you think the about the part of uh, Mother Goose? I uh, I was obsessed with it uh, because Mother Goose is... I love that part. Is not a thing in South America. I actually was going to dive onto that. Well, thank you that you brought it up. Uh, the way that um, you are using traditional folkloric elements to make uh -huh. your own magic was very, very unique. Um, and I say traditional folkloric ways, not necessarily in a religious type of environment. This was just a story. And um, it's funny how these characters use these rhymes from these stories that were read to the little kids to make magic. Uh, the binding spell with the little spider uh, within the, the cup. Genius. Genius. Um, it did remind me, because I also love pop culture, um, Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. Um, I, I love that show. Incredible. I love that. Um, it did gave me that type of vibe. Uh, the reality is that my magic kind of works like that. You know, I, mm -hmm. I do appreciate Wicca for being such a powerful movement that popularize yeah, and open absolutely. the doors for so many practitioners but at the same time when i began when i began my path within uh, witchcraft i was just getting my books from amazon and the only thing that i knew was wicca and it was exactly that uh get three candles three three uh pink, pink candles and amethyst and all of that all these are of end of roses make a circle call the corners i'm like okay i get it this is the step but why you know the, wh what am i connecting with what am i doing exactly with this? exactly you know? and, and, and that was my thing and when i read this book that uh, you wrote obviously <laughs> you when i read your book when i read yeah. the story of jonathan he's taking the spider why the spider because this little animal is going to capture uh my enemies in the same way that uh this little animal captures um it's the animals that they are going to eat so I was like, oh, we're seeing similarities. Now I get it. You know, we are seeing like the comparison. It was genius. I loved it. That was all Jonathan because I remember I would, I had my ancestral vessel and I would light a candle and the incense. I said, okay, Jonathan. And he'd, and I would see pictures and he, spirits sometimes they, they uh, talk to you like how we're talking. Sometimes they will put pictures in your head or a feeling. And he was just, telling the story i remember normally when i write a book you have to research it and write and it takes a year to write it takes a long time this i wrote in eight weeks just because jonathan was like boom 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 he was just telling me the story and it was simple yeah it was crazy are, are we seeing a second book of jonathan no so i wrote a book over the because summer the was very open allow me to say <laughs> uh -huh. i wrote a book i wrote a book that's coming out 2024 halloween it comes out in about a year from now and i can say it has storytelling lots and lots and lots of spells like so many spells jonathan has an appearance okay. i can say that jonathan has an appearance it's an entirely different story in fact it's an entirely different time so here's the thing that sucks when you're a writer until it's edited and copy written you're kind of um sworn to secrecy so i can't even but disclose too many no, details no and stuff it's you know idea. however however However, it's exciting. Very proud of the. I'm very proud of Jonathan, but the upcoming book, I'm very proud of it too. You'll see. You'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was it was a very nice experience. Uh, get to read about Jonathan, and at the end I, again. Um, touching upon these different characters. Obviously, we get to see about the um, the fairy folk. The no. Okay. Uh, which was very interesting for me to notice because even with five years within this country, I was still assuming that Faye is still something from Europe, um, which 
my big surprise was to get to ask even here we do get um, a lot of these different um, stories that definitely were brought ironically in my country as well we do have duendes which uh, it will mm. roughly translated will be like goblins ish Ooh, it, that's it, awesome it, it it is but what i'm trying to say is that these different stories do travel across continents something that did interest me was the um, let's say sexual awakening or more like the physical experience that Jonathan had with the Fae Folk. Uh -huh. I want to get, I have a couple of ideas in my mind when I read about it. And certainly uh -huh. I do think that witchcraft is a wonderful way to break from the parameters that are given from society and uh, mm -hmm. this westernized Christian society that we mm -hmm. uh, live in. But Tell me a little bit about that, <laughs> because I'm very interested. <laughs> um, so you have to remember, uh, when it comes to the fairies and things like that, they have their own morality. Yes. And they're pre-Christian. Um, you know, the fairies have been talked about for thousands of years in different mythologies and stories and things like that. And so we have to be careful about super posing Christian ideas and 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 rules and, and laws on the fairy culture and the fairy Start culture is, is is very akin to the uh, um, pagan culture because yes. pagans and fairies are both stewards of the land you know and so they have their own sexual immorality and you know one of the things um is that the majority of fairies aren't straight or gay they're very fluid you know um the interesting thing side note and i'm and i'm very happy about this a lot of our younger generation are very fluid now yes you know? absolutely and like i'm seeing you know straight guys who are 20 who are like oh i have a girlfriend but I play with this other guy too, or whatever. And I'm thinking, cool, that's fairy fairy. Fairies don't have this whole, I'm a man, I can yes. only do man things. Fairies don't think like that. And not because they're weak or even necessarily feminine per se, but they don't really give a shit about, they're so powerful, they don't have to prove to you through masculinity Absolutely. how powerful they are. And I really appreciate that. And, you know, Jonathan talks about that in the book. And it's a very romantic story he tells. Yes. Um, but again, he's a, a witch. And you know how we are as witches. There's always a twist at the end every single time. Um, I've just, I have learned that my life as a witch, everything has a twist at the end. Yes. And it's, that's just how it's going to be. Yeah, you have to just, you have to go with it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I just did find um, very interesting that, um, I mean, historically speaking, um, witchcraft, or at least witchcraft, when we see it um, here in this side of the continent, uh, well, I, I mean, overall, uh, in uh, also in Spain and Portugal, but at least here, we do see it that... Um, it was equal to sexual liberation and practically uh, i would i like to say sexual liberation but for the christian it was more like deprivation and all of that but i did love to see that jonathan did get the traditional experience of witchcraft and not seeing uh mm -hmm. This world that's in this existence and this life in the same way that let's say the, the other people might see it and his experience was very cool and me as a as a, a pansexual person i did love to get to see that jonathan had a experience not only of learning magic from the fae and not only connecting with the energies of them and healing but also um a sort of sexual awakening so it was a very cool mm -hmm. um element yeah. to be seen in the book there's so much more to say <laughs> i do feel that there is so much things that we call i could keep talking about this book for hours but do you have any recommendation for uh, listeners beginners especially um within you know their first steps within witchcraft Top anytime <laughs> you can find a traditional witchcraft book 
I think there's a great one of my favorite authors, and I love him. I love him. Is he, he's from uh, Britain. His name is uh, Nigel Pearson. He yes. he wrote he wrote Treading the Mill, but I love him. Yeah. I think he's fabulous. Um, uh, Michael Howard is great. Robin Gardison is is really he good. The thing about Robin is. He has such a wealth of information. He tells you everything. So his books tend to be very wordy, yeah. but um, it's it's really uh, for good information. I like Matt Arn. I yes. like A Storm Fairy Wolf is very good. Devin Hunter is very good. Laura Tempest Zorkroft is amazing. Yes. If you're into a more glamorized pretty goddess-oriented witchcraft. And my friend Michael Herkes is really good. Absolutely. I, I love them. I, I had the opportunity to uh, be with so them. Michael? And, yeah, absolutely. We had the opportunity to talk about um, Cinderella, a um, storybook podcast. I had the opportunity to get to meet them there. You um, know, Aaron is actually a part of my uh, coven. Did you know that? I did not know that. I actually got to uh, Freighter Aaron hear about is the one book. of my yes. Uh, Freighter Aaron is one of my favorite people in the world. I He's love amazing. him. He he is just a, sh a shining star in my life. I love him. I don't but talk to him as often as as I can. I will say I'm gonna have to give him props whenever he can come to a, a, a ritual or a class. I'm teaching, he always comes. I love him, like he's fabulous. You know, one of the things I wanna tell people, tell people who are learning is there's a lot of magical books out there and a lot of authors. And it's really not about the hype. It really isn't about Amazon reviews. It really isn't about who does a TikTok. It's about what you are connected to. However, I, I will say one of my favorite authors um, Kemet Arn has a lot of followers, so, so he's fabulous. However, it isn't always about that because I have seen I've seen authors who don't sell a lot of books, but they are great. but are just so good and rich and deep. And I yes. think that a lot of people look at a look at the title or look at you know how many Kenny reviews does it have, and and you have to remember a lot of people are brand new. And so brand new people buy introductory books, yes, which I think is great. However, some of us who are intermediate or advanced, we want advanced books and there aren't as, as many people yes. or authors. So, so just because you don't see a lot of reviews doesn't mean it isn't a good book. There's an author who I love, his name is Michael Kelly. And he writes about dragons, dragon magic, and stuff like that. And he's great. He's amazing. But he doesn't have a whole bunch of reviews. However, I think he's great. So there's, there's that. You just gave me the next recommendation. It's all good. I'm definitely going to take this recommendation. And I am adding it to my TBR already. So thanks. Uh, thanks for sharing. And, and Absolutely. And thanks for all the recommendations as well. And also, thanks for giving me the time. Like... Uh, coming out of nowhere and be like hey i want to talk about your book so i i love doing shows like this and they're <laughs> fun and i like to promote uh brand new videos and podcasts and things yeah. so i'm happy to do it i appreciate that indeed chris thank you so much indeed and thank you so much for writing about uh jonathan not Bristol. i think that it was very inspiring and it was a wonderful reading and as i said i will be recommending this book to uh new practitioners thank you especially thank those you are focused on traditional witchcraft and thanks everybody for being here i do appreciate you all as well feel free to comment like share and also please by all means follow chris um get to buy more of his books uh support the witch community <laughs> and, yes yes support us please yeah <laughs> bye bye everybody take care